compressibility and also correlations uh, in turbine combustion. So we'll start with you. Okay, Thank you. The relation of what? <laughs> uh, we'll start with, uh, okay, we uh, will discuss uh, different maybe analytical approaches in turbine combustion, particular applications of uh, two-point correlation functions in turbine combustion. Are you okay. for that? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but I, I managed to move it maybe to uh, yeah. the topic uh, we are actually working on thermoacoustics. I think yes, this yes. is okay. uh, what, what I would like to talk about. Okay. As I missed this opportunity on Monday, I would like yeah. to give you a brief overview about myself, if you don't mind. So, uh, and to most of you, I talked already yesterday, but not all of you I, I, I have seen. So, uh, I, I worked for about 10 years in industry at ABB and Alstom, and since 2003 I took the chair uh, of fluid dynamics in Berlin and working there. And we have multiple um, focal points of our research. So one, of, of course, is generally turbulence. Then we are working a lot on turbulent combustion, <laughs> low NOx burners uh, in, in specifically, and thermoacoustics is a very important topic. We are also working a lot on control, so combining all these approaches, how to handle, how to um, get low emission burners for different operating conditions, how to control thermoacoustics, so combustion control, as well as flow control applied to airports, on airplanes, but also flow control on wind turbines and so on. This is a general overview, um, just to show you quickly, this is a wind tunnel. Uh, we have, it's for, I mean, for our scale, quite large wind tunnel. It's actually the largest in the Berlin area. Of course, there's much bigger wind tunnels, but uh, we do a lot of uh, significant work there for building and vehicle aerodynamics, uh, lift and drag control, separation control. Uh, we use uh, modern actuators like uh, fluidics and plasma assisted actuators and uh, the wind tunnel is also low noise so we use it as well for noise uh, uh, reduction actually. And this is an example, so a lot of power stations and so on have been in our wind tunnel. This is a working horse, this is not very scientific but it's interesting because you get in contact with a lot of companies and this, for example, is an example of a new of a power station which exists in Hamburg, uh, a town in northern Germany, and they uh, built a lot of new buildings around this power station. And you see here the size of the current chimney when compared to the other buildings. So our topic is to simulate in CFD as well as in wind tunnel experiments the flow around such a power station and to predict whether the fumes get uh, in, in contact with buildings and uh, this is not only for for the um, uh, for, for, for the products you have in your exhaust gas but it's also interesting for water condensation for example <coughs> in these areas it can be cold in the winter so you can condensation on buildings and this freezes and then you have ice plates falling down so a lot of interest actually to, to avoid this. It, it's also interesting, uh, actually, what's going on there. Then you, politically, because you predict then a certain size of a chimney, and then you go to the authorities and discuss it and say, well, this must be the size of the chimney, not uh, to influence all the buildings. And then they say, well, it sounds very good, your analysis, but then this chimney is higher than any church here. In <laughs> so this doesn't work. So you see uh, how, how science in, in these cases can works. make the building a shorter. Yeah, exactly. Or make it as a shape of a church or something like this. So this is interesting for students. So we have a lot of student projects regarding racing cars and so on. But um, for us, more interesting is actually these devices, for example, because uh, this is also a little bit our mission. We are doing research to reduce generally CO2 emissions. So this applies to gas turbines, wind turbines, power stations in general, but also to vehicle aerodynamics like trains and 
uh, trucks. And uh, I mean, do you see here the strong recirculation zone? And it's of course very easy to um, make this whole thing a little bit more aerodynamically shaped. But then you have a lot of problems to load it uh, with the size, with the length, and so on. So this is our one of our uh, main topics to. Uh, reduce the drag by applying active control at the end of this truck so that you can maintain the general shape but you have some kind of flow control device to let the flow see a more aerodynamically shaped body and thus to reduce drag. So this is uh, of, of uh, high interest. Also here um, it's, it's, it's uh, it got, gets a lot into psychology of the people because of course you can shape also this truck here more aerodynamically but for example in the US all these truck drivers the trucks have to have a certain shape and have to have a certain look so it's very difficult to apply changes to this and therefore this uh, active flow control uh, is, is one of the topics which are uh, maybe suitable this is on wind turbines, so wind turbines get larger and larger, in diameter now at least 80 meters plus, uh, and then you get a lot of aerodynamic problems there actually, because the blade sees completely different velocities here on the bottom when going to the top, and this problem is increasing uh, with the size. Uh, generally you can have uh, pitch control of your blades but the bigger the larger the blades get the more difficult is it to adjust them fast enough and uh, therefore flow control might be uh, a solution for this. It's uh, very difficult to apply actually flow control for example to airplanes uh, they are very conservative also to gas turbines and so on but on these devices maybe there's no other solutions. So this seems to be very attractive actually for flow control. And this is uh, fun for, for me because I like sailing and therefore we get in touch also with the people from the America's Cup and did some work on this and this uh, gave me actually the opportunity to participate on, on the races there sitting as an 18th uh, man there on the back which was very interesting. And uh, also for the students, uh, we have them sailing on, on my boat, applying different kinds of flow control to the sails and uh, measuring um, the performance of the boat and these kind of issues. So this is uh, more like, uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, all the world is fun, but this is uh, of specific fun in the summer to do this. So. What kind of measurements? Well, what we measure on, on yeah. board, very simple. Um, we measure speed and uh, we measure the wind velocity, we measure the position. So for example, one issue is to have a good map of uh, the flow velocities. And what you see here is a measurement, you see all the different vectors and uh, the environment actually changes, uh, as you know, with, with the recirculation zones and so on and enhancement uh, via cups and so on changes completely the wind profile. So we tried to predict this actually using CFD, which was uh, very difficult in that scale, and uh, validate this via measurements we take on board uh, with, with the boat. So this is one issue. Then we measure, of course, uh, measurements we apply, for example, to the sails and different trimming, how this affects the velocity of the boat for the different courses. And uh, there's also a mechanics professor who's very interested in this, and he actually uh, measures the exact shape of the sails and uh, how you can modify it to get better performance, um, fluid structure and damage and so on. So this is uh, what we are, yeah, and what we are generally doing a little bit of medical research. We are associated with an institute, with another institute, uh, which is affiliated with our institute, uh, which works closely with hospitals, and uh, there we have a lot of fluid dynamics application also in uh, for medicine, actually. For example, blood flow in vessels, there are also recirculation, turbulence, and so on plays a role, and we are developing together with another company 
um, ventricular assist devices, heart assisting devices, for example. Uh, we worked with another company on these incubators. The um, challenge here is to get the very uniform temperature distribution and humidity distribution in these devices. Also when you open them. So if you want to, for example, do some uh, investigations on, the, on this newborn uh, little baby, it's very important that you do not open it for too long time because the temperature drops and affects immediately uh, this uh, baby there. And therefore, we have um, kind of a fluid dynamic uh, curtain which uh, keeps the temperature now constant. So this was done together with the company this development. So this gives you an overview a little bit of the work we are doing in Berlin. And now I want to come, ah yeah, and of course maybe this still as an introduction on, on combustion. Uh, we are interested in low NOx combustion, as I said, on combustion chambers and boilers. Uh, specific interest is thermoacoustics, as this is a big problem, combustion noise as well. And there we would like to model the soap process as well as to control it. We are also working on new combustion concepts like hydrogen combustion, ultraviolet combustion. I discussed this with a few of you yesterday and uh, also on advanced sensors to measure, for example, pulsations in combustors. Good. So thermoacoustics. Um, to initiate this a little bit, I, have a, I don't know how many slides on thermoacoustics, probably about 500 to 1,000, so I would limit myself here to a few to start the discussion. But of course, depending on how this discussion goes later on, I can pull out more and more. But I think, first of all, I would limit myself to describe a little bit uh, the problem and maybe also just to discuss in, in what or what I think the current problems are in thermoacoustics. So as I said, I have been working quite extensively in a company on this because it's really a problem in modern gas turbines. I mean, also the space race was affected, by the way. Uh, the Americans, as well as the Russians, worked a lot on thermoacoustics as these highly amplified um, thermoacoustic pulsations destroyed the rockets, actually. And who actually controlled it first could uh, get people higher up and so on. So this was a real problem. And gas turbines, as well, and gas turbines, um, well, I've seen a lot of uh, destroyed combustion chambers, but even if you do not destroy your whole combustor, it certainly limits your operational range. So you cannot run your gas turbine as you want it to run. So generally, this affects, for example, the emissions. I always say it's very easy to control thermoacoustics, but then uh, the birds fall off the trees because you produce so much NOx, and this is really not the intention. So it's really related. It's a tightly... It's, it's tightened to, to the emissions of your combustor. What's the Mach number typical for... Well, it depends where you look at. I can discuss it a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I mean, generally said, it's low Mach number. Mm -hmm. There's a few points in the combustor of high Mach number, but generally here we are talking about low Mach number. So you can, even if you simulate the acoustics, it's easy enough if you just take the Helmholtz equation and not even the compact. So, um, I don't know how familiar you are, you are with thermoacoustics. Well, you are? Explain you, that. Sorry? Maybe, how do you explain that? Yeah, okay. Um, so, what you generally have is you have unsteady, you, know, you, you have, of course, in your, it's, I have a better picture later on, but uh, generally you have a compressor in the gas turbine, and this air then goes here into some plenum and from there into a gas turbine burner. And thus you have highly turbulent flow. This turbulent flow might even have some flow instabilities, some inherent instabilities, and they modulate the heat release of your burner. And this modulated heat release expands the surrounding air, leads to acoustic perturbations which propagate in your combustor and will be reflected by the acoustic boundary conditions of your combustor. So for example, 
at the end of your combustor, when you enter into the turbine, you have generally a, a closed, acoustically closed end, and this will reflect the acoustic wave and affect again uh, the heat release uh, of your burner. So you have a feedback cycle which might get unstable and lead then to quite high amplitudes. So we are talking about 100, 200, up to two bar pressure pulsations in a combustor, and that's, that's actually quite, quite high. So this is the general problem. Well, really criterion you probably know, so heat release and pressure fluctuations are the base. And the, these are larger than your losses, your dissipated losses and your flux over the boundaries, you get amplification of your sound wave, and this leads them to these high amplitudes. <laughs> I got a new computer, so this is not moving generally. This picture should move. You should see, but couldn't uh, find the original this morning. Um, what, what happens there is you get this fluctuating flame. Also typical for these devices, I can show it properly later to you, is that this flame stays more or less at the same position. It fluctuates slightly in the position, but the most important point is the fluctuating heat release. And if you Record this by pressure fluctuations, for example. Typical pressure fluctuations look then like this. You can also look at the chemiluminescence and record OH uh, chemiluminescence, for example, and then you see uh, uh, also there the uh, fluctuations actually in the heat ring. It's a typical pulsation spectrum then looks like this. So it consists of a number of uh, acoustic peaks plus the general background noise. And the background noise, for example, is becoming also more and more interesting. This is specifically true for aircraft engines. So when they are in approach, you can use an acoustic camera to locate the different sound sources on the landing aircraft. And then you see a lot of noise, of course, coming from the flaps and so on when they are out. This is one issue actually of research also, but you can see or you can hear with this acoustic camera also the engine, the combustor. So it's a clear correlation with the combustion and uh, that indicates that even combustion noise plays uh, somewhat a role. Although the term acoustic problem is more significant, but combustion noise is getting also important. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the typical pressure oscillation level? It depends, as I said, in a gas turbine combustor operated at 20 to 30 bar, um, you get 100 millibar up to um, 1,000 to 2,000 millibars. So this means that uh, this pressure oscillation will not affect the combustion that much. Am I right? Uh, that's it's, it's not clear, it, not, it does not affect the chemistry, but our approach generally is that it has not a strong in influence on the chemistry of the combustion. Yes, that's it's true. It's kind of one way from the heat release. Mm -hmm. If you have unsteady heat release, yeah. uh, somehow through ready criterion, it couples with the pressure oscillation. Yes. And then amplify the whole thing. Also. That is true, yeah. But I mean, of course, if we talk about the mechanisms, which mm -hmm. I did not want to raise because right, let's quickly say there's a number of mechanisms yeah. uh, leading to thermoacoustic instability. So you have, first of all, of course, turbulence, but this is broadband, this is uncorrelated, uh, and therefore does only contribute to the combustion noise. Then you have in your flow instabilities, they are coherent and they lead to coherent heat release, there's correlation, and they can actually get amplified. You have um, equivalence ratio fluctuations. This means you inject your fuel at constant mass flow, and you have a fluctuating air column uh, within your burner, so you get, um, you get fluctuations of your mixing um, uh, ratio. And this, uh, of course, has also an influence on the heat release. Then you have fluctuations generally in power, and you have um, fluctuation in the mass flow, and this creates fluctuations in the power. So this is a, another um, excitation mechanism. You might get some interaction with chemistry, 
which in our approach generally is neglected. You have uh, influences on the flame speed, so you get a slight changement in the position of the flame. I mean, if you, the turbulent flame speed is, if you want, proportional to turbulence, right, in the first uh, approximation in highly turbulent flows. I mean, there's much better models and so on, but let's say turbulent flame speed proportional to U prime uh, square average, and this means um, if you have a highly excited jet, of course also the turbulence level changes in a periodic way and this makes your flame fluctuate in space. This is a little bit the mechanism, but there might be also an interaction with the chemistry which I, we did not look in detail into it yet because it seems to have a minor effect, but I do not say it does not exist. When you say in your approach, what do you mean? In your observed experiments or in your calculation? You don't take into account this. Well, in the experiments, of course, it's somewhat in, right? Yeah. I mean, but uh, if you do not take it into account in your models, uh -huh. that means, well, if the model then fits, probably it has not a big influence. So. But you know, I think uh, some, uh, how to say, phenomena exist which associate both uh, fluctuation of pressure and, uh, uh, say, uh, chemical, maybe instability. Because if you've got uh, compressible uh, uh, contribution to turbulence, you've got some kind of formation of clusterization of, of your chemical spaces. As a result, maybe increase uh, say, chemical reaction and realize, release of uh, thermal energy, increasing noise, and so I, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. There is, there is, there must be an influence, of course. There's, if you increase pressure, you have an influence on the chemistry. But uh, the other components. There's a positive feedback coupling when flame stability affects the acoustic, and it depends on the how how parameters are. Yeah, of course, it is effect. Yeah, I mean, I, this has an, as, as I just wanted to say, this has certainly an influence, but when compared to the other parameters uh, leading to these instabilities, it's <coughs> now thought for this, this kind of application to play a minor role, but it is there, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, why is it so important in, in these new combustors? I mean, combustion you have since uh, hundreds of years uh, also been used, and of course it was also um, seen before, but going to these um, low emission combustors, the problem becomes more and more important, and this is because you operate your combustor in order to achieve these ultra low emissions in the very lean regime. So we are not talking about stoichiometry, stoichiometric combustion, which would be here at this equivalence ratio of one, but um, here in this range. And already the laminar flame speed, for example, depends highly on the equivalence ratio. So if you small fluctuation in equivalence ratio, because of the steep slope of the curve, will give you strong fluctuation in the already in the laminar flame speed. Then, uh, also in flame temperature, the uh, curve here in the lean regime, generally the gas turbine combustors operated here at uh, an equivalence ratio of 0.5, gives you a very <coughs> steep slope in terms of the adiabatic flame temperature. And this is why this problem is so apparent in modern gas turbine combustors. Um, where does it play a role? Well, I think you know. Um, this is a little bit <laughs> more specific um, looking at the combustor, and this maybe can answer also this question about the Mach numbers. So you have a quite high Mach number here at the exit of your compressor, but then you have a diffuser again, so you slow down your flow and gain pressure, and then it enters into the burner, and also here you have uh, low velocities, here, maybe you are getting about um, a Mach number of 0.1 at the exit of the burner, but not more generally. And then your area increases again, so your Mach number goes again uh, down. So you have a very 
low Mach numbers. So this is this is actually positive for modeling the soil approach. You can you always use um, <coughs> the the uh, low Mach number limit, and then at the exit of your combustor, you reach a very high Mach number. Actually, when you get into the guide vanes of the turbine, you have Mach numbers close to one. But um, generally, one wants this as one acoustic element in this case and says if the Mach number is uh, this large, you, this end here acts as acoustically closed. So you have full reflection of acoustic waves. It's not fully true also. Um, actually, it's also an interesting topic to investigate in a more detailed way how sound waves are being transmitted through nozzles with high Mach numbers. There has been some work by Poinceau and, and so on, some theoretical approaches, very nice works actually. Um, it lacks a little bit experimental validation, uh, these models. But this is the models we use in order to uh, simulate the acoustic boundary condition at the end. So generally, low Mach number, not though at the exit of your combustor. cause severe problems like you see here uh, in these combustors here for example this was uh, totally uh, destroyed this combustor and uh, I have seen this as well uh, we developed a new burner in our company and started the engine with this new burner not a lot of changes actually it was behaving much better in terms of emissions and then we started it and it started to rumble and it's really tremendous if you stay beside the turbine I mean the whole floor is starting to shake and you <laughs> think this is the end of the world <laughs> and it ended actually very badly because really the combustor was destroyed after this and uh, then you have to, I mean this engine is then sold so you have a problem then to deliver it in time because first you have to solve this problem because this engine as such cannot be operated so fortunately in this case, and if you are talking a little bit about control, maybe during the time here, I can show you what we have done in this case. But it is a severe problem. Was this the one that uh, being sued in the USA? Well, there was a case actually where the company got sued, but it was not with this new burner. This was <laughs> the first delivery. But I mean, yeah, also, I mean, to keep this a little bit uh, in mind, and. The problem, of course, is you deliver a gas turbine and it should operate. You sell it and at a certain time it should get into operation and then you um, guarantee a certain availability, you guarantee a certain power output and so on. All fine. This was uh, a little bit during the crisis. A lot of turbines got sold and then all of a sudden the market got down and nobody needed the energy anymore. So what do you do if you are a power generation company you paid a lot for the turbine, but you don't need the power. So the best way is to give it back. And how can you give it back? Well, you cannot just return it. Like you buy now a television and at home you see, well, maybe I don't like it, I bring it back. This is not possible with a power station. I mean, it's much more money involved and so on. So what you say, you look at the performance of it and it does not have the exact performance. For example, power output. Maybe it's 1% or 1.5% less than what you guarantee. <laughs> so you say, it's not uh, fulfilling the uh, specifications, I want to give it back. And then you start suing. So this is also <laughs> the problem. It's not only the problem, but of course the thermal cost problem was there, but uh, we did a lot to solve it, and um, I worked in a number of task forces, and I think from that side we did a very good job and solved things also pretty fast. So this was putting, placing in some uh, immediate changes which um, did not affect so much the performance but got rid at least for this operational range for certain uh, turbines uh, that the turbine could be operated. The problem also there is it depends on a lot of environmental issues. You have a turbine let's say operating in south of France or in Northern Africa where it's hot and you have a turbine in Alaska and they behave completely different. And 
And that is also a problem. Anyway, this shows you a little bit how it's not only getting sued because you have a problem, there might be other issues behind it. This is what I wanted want to say. Okay, um, and this shows two things here. One, for example, you have, for example, the homogeneity in your mixing distribution and the more homogeneous the mixer is, so the fully steered reactor, the better generally your emissions are, and that you see here by this NOx curve. So this goes down, the better the mixing is. The problem is, and therefore as I said, these are combined. When you get better mixing, you get better emissions, but with the better emissions generally what happens is that your phasations increase. This is these uh, yellow triangles. And then there's a, uh, a border at which you cannot operate your combustor. Anymore. This is experimental data? This is uh, experimental data, actually, from, um, from a real gas to yeah. mm -hmm. It Sometimes this limit occurs even earlier. It's just showing you one example of what limits it. So NOx and if you play this, NOx and CO are correlated <laughs> like this. So you have here your um, pressure pulsations, and here you have NOx, and the lower the, uh, yeah, the, the, high, the higher the NOx emissions, the lower is your pressure pulsations, and vice versa. This is the problem. And, but you have to have both. And what is the physics of the What is the physics? The physics is, as I said, in this, you can find it already in this diagram. This is one explanation. So the, this is for a perfectly well stirred reactor, this behavior, and this slope gets flatter if you have a more distributed flame. So if you go to a non-homogeneous mixture, means you are getting more to a diffusion type flame, and the diffusion type flame generally is, is longer, so you have a, a longer flame, plus your changes in terms of the equivalence ratio, in terms of with respect to flame speed, as well as with respect to temperature, are not that inherent. And another issue is, which I will show you in maybe, where I'm going to show this, maybe in this figure. Uh, yeah. <coughs> maybe in this figure. You have here fuel supply combustion, and this creates a certain time delay. So if you have a fluctuation of your air column within your burner, you get, for example, a fluctuation in your equivalence ratio. This fluctuation in the equivalence ratio is being convected towards the flame. And this needs a certain time, a time delay. And you can imagine if this time delay fits very well and is very uniform uh, across the flame, then you get a, an immediate response of your thermal acoustics. If you, for example, increase your unmixedness, going in this curve which I just showed, towards more towards a, 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 a non-homogeneous mixture, then these time delays here will change. The flame shape changes, it gets longer, and therefore you get time delays, a, a strong distribution of time delays within your flame, and then your system does not uh, respond that immediately so it's to... Distributed in the space. But it's, it's more distributed in space. But here you, you can control uh, NOx as a function of pressure. Yeah. Then there is another explanation. Yeah. Because pressure pulsation, sorry. P prime, right? Well, this is P prime. Pressure rotation. Uh, because of, uh, you know, um, a smaller uh, pressure is uh, a slower reaction. And because of this, a uh, lower temperature and... Uh, this was this influence on the chemistry. Yeah. It is there, I agree, but it's... In, in these kind of devices, it's not the main factor. In, in general, the yeah. uh, amount of uh, nitrogen oxide depends on the temperature of the plane. Mm -hmm. As high temperature is more 
uh, the, the produced uh, nitrogen oxides. So I think that this should be the, 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 the most important factor. I can, I can explain this quickly as well. I, what, maybe to show this or to explain what I quickly draw here is really the dependence of changing, for example, operational parameters, like this uh, unmixedness in your burn. The, how you, or let's say, going in, in this way, you're going from, a, this is a more diffusion type flame, this is a fully premixed flame, okay? And this, shows such a behavior. If you go to fully premixed, your NOx emission will decrease, but your pressure pulsations increase. But you're fully right. If you look, for example, into a case um, where you have, let's say, um, we have here like phi or lambda, and uh, you, or let's say power, that is also it may be clearer. So you increase power of your combustor, generally also with increasing power, your pulsations go higher. So this is uh, one case. Then maybe you have a combustor which you can control by active means or by passive means. And uh, we can talk about this, what passive means are. So this is, then the fluctuations go lower and because you control your combustor, and what you see also, what you observe also in this case, generally your NOx does not depend so much on, on power, is that for this case here, let's call it one. One, the NOx emissions are here, and for case two, where we control the pulsations, the NOx emissions are lower. And this can be explained by the following figure. If you have here, you're fine, and you have here, NOx emission, then going to a um, richer flame increases your NOx emission and also actually CO depends exponentially. And while, because this depends ex exponentially, due to the fluctuation in phi you get, you are right that your NOx emissions under, um, under the presence of thermoacoustic oscillations will increase. So fully, fully agreed. The figure that you have in the middle, yes. the NOx uh, and P prime correlation, this is at the same phi condition, yeah. at a different inhomogeneity. But different inhomogeneity. Yes. Yeah. With the uh, on the left hand side you have not so homogeneous, and then you to the right you have more homogeneous. Here it's non homogeneous, here it's more yeah. homogeneous. Yeah. yeah. And this is of course for me. My question is uh, homogeneity. How do you define homogeneity? You have 170 or something. What is how is defined? Homogeneity? Well, I mean, what what we measure, for example, if we do this, and for, for this reason we do a lot of mixing experiments, for example, in water, we just uh, measure the concentration and compare to a mean concentration. This gives you an unmixedness factor. It can be defined in different ways. And I do not remember what specifically. Uh, we use now here, but uh, that's the general case. You measure at spatially at different, you measure temporally and spatially the unmixedness and uh, compare this against uh, the mean uh, value. And this gives you some unmixedness in space as well as in time. And both play well. Could, could so you I am as so measuring different points, yeah? Yeah, well, in space and in time. Yeah, yeah. okay. So we take actually, if we measure the mixture quality, we do lift measurements, having a laser sheet, observing it with a CCD camera, mm -hmm. and observe it at different times and in space, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can determine fluctuations and you can calculate gradient. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Distribution of mean and square. Exactly. Okay. Uh, but if you have a fully premix, all time the same equivalence ratio. Very good point, what, yeah. What, what, uh, what we have in this case? Um, your explanation is very flammable when we prepare something, but if sure. it's prepared... I mean, we are talking, we are, it's a very good issue also. We are talking here about uh, premix combustion, and then that means already, okay, we are premix. So what, like, where, do, where the heck do we get these equivalence ratio fluctuations in? But 
In a normal gas burner, I think this is clear because you have your fluctuating air column. Yeah, because uh, oh, right. Right. And yeah. you don't have enough time. What yeah. we do, or what we did in order to, for example, uh, investigate actually this issue was we, uh, this plan on here is quite long. So what we did was to inject very much at the beginning of the plenum fuel and mix it with the air. So you have, while it arrives at the burner, a pre, what we call a pre-premixed uh, case. So yes, this, do we still get instabilities or not? I think this was your question, right? Yes, yeah. this is my question. What do you think? We can have also instability. My opinion, you, you will have instability, uh -huh. but maybe not like with other, yeah, yeah. with, with, with other uh -huh. dependents. I don't know what depends. Yeah. Could, could, well, the answer to this question, could it be that you get instability anyway, because when you are very lean, you are on the verge of extinction? Mm -hmm. This is one issue, for example. The other issue is, of course, that you, s you have multiple mechanisms, as I explained, you have the equivalence ratio fluctuations, which is one mechanism, but it's uh, equally important seems to be flow instabilities, because flow instabilities create different levels. If you have a vortex, which uh, is formed and convected downstream, it changes the turbulence level along its way, and when it breaks down, it creates fine scale turbulence and so on. So you get periodic fluctuations in your turbulence level due to flow instabilities. And that has an effect, for example, again, on the flame velocity, so in a similar way. So you still get instabilities due to these other mechanisms which are present, uh, like flow instabilities and power fluctuations. <coughs> power fluctuations. This is the same dependence on the X of what we have in this case. Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure actually at this moment. Um, because here is clear. Yeah, it's clear. Here it is clear. But this is correct, yeah. If it's fully mixed from the good what do you have? Well, I mean, this, I think you still get this dependence, although I'm, I do not have, I, I also should have some data actually on this, but I don't have it quite here. But what happens if you, I mean, this phi, which is formed, is of course an overall phi we are discussing. But if you have uh, injection of a fuel-air mixture into your combustor, you have also the burnt products already in your combustor and recirculation on this. And this will locally, not in a global level, but locally affect also your phi. And thus, I think also NOx level will still depend on the fluctuation level, although you have a fully pre premixed case. Yes, I agree, but the water in it's the same qualitative more. No, or pro I mean, qualitative probably a little less, yeah, but uh, it will still be there, this dependence, yeah. I just want to speak about mathematical modeling. Yeah, we can go into this also okay. later. Yeah. It's interesting to discuss yeah. mathematical so yeah. We can, can do that, yeah. So when you this this pre pre mix thing, yeah. I mean then you really do not want the flashbacks into your plenum, right? Because it's obviously a big long one and yeah. it's a big band. Yeah. So you have some kind of off plane trap or no? Or? We uh, actually at this when we did these experiments for the first time we were also quite concerned. So <laughs> I had the uh, I had an uh, engineer who was uh, running always the experiments and he closed the whole hole. And it was just the two of us sitting in the control room <laughs> standing with the mouth open if an explosion occurs that you do not get your <laughs> ears hurt and so but nothing happened. I mean you have to do it careful. What we do is we first run the burner in a premixed mode and then we increase slowly the pre premixing level by reducing the fuel to the burner itself. <coughs> and therefore you have it in a controlled mm. manner, plus, of course, observation. So we had the glass tube here and the camera detecting if there was flashback, and in this case we would have um, shut down immediately the gas flow. Yeah. But it was always, uh, I mean, also now in Berlin we do it uh, quite often, and uh, yeah, it's always a little challenge. <laughs> <laughs> You also mentioned modeling here. Yeah. 
And I mean, if you have these very simple access metric things, you could do even some, some wave equation solver mm -hmm. stuff. But when you have these gas turbines, complex geometry. Also oh, then, I can show you, maybe let's go to this. So this is where the curves that we discussed. Um, this is test race. Um, don't need to. Maybe some, some modeling. Um, so maybe in the first in a very general way, and then we can go deeper and deeper maybe into but first of all, what is the general assessment? The general assessment is, I mean, first of all, we have low frequencies here generally. So we are talking about frequencies of less than 500 hertz or so. They occur in annular combustors, so also there, generally, you have either plane wave propagation downstream or in azimuthal direction. I show you that um, it, depending how you model your acoustic field, you can also apply it, for example, to complex geometries where you have a lot of higher modes in your combustor, higher acoustic modes. That works as well. But let's come to this later. The general approach is that you try to model from first principles the wave propagation in an annular duct. And that's very easy. It's uh, done by the Helmholtz equation for all different modes, azimuthal modes, longitudinal modes, which are there. Uh, <coughs> so this is uh, the modeling of the acoustics. This can be either done analytically, so you can derive this uh, analytically, the wave propagation, or what we even do now is the finite element analysis of the combustor. So you do a full 3D finite element analysis of your combustor. And this gives you the impedance at the burner exit. So you have the full impedance and for different places also of, the, of your burners. So this is easy. This can be done, as I said, from first principle. The, and we can do the same for the planner. Also for that pedagogical yeah. purposes, could you, could you please show the equations? Yeah. Shall, well, let's, okay. let's first talk about what the principles are, and then I'll show you some equations. The main problem is how to model this burner. And this uh, is actually the most difficult part. And i show you also how uh, later in some equations how, how we can do this. But our general approach is we have an analytical model, and, and within this analytical model, Time delays play a role, the acoustics like um, uh, reduced length for the acoustics and, <coughs> and, uh, and the pressure loss coefficient. This is the, mo the main parameters which influence this. But it's very difficult to predict this behavior from first principle. So it's a very analytical model which I can show you in a moment. And uh, the coefficients for this are coming out of measurement. So we measure, actually, the transfer function of this burner. And that is then being placed into a, a network model. And this allows you then, for example, to predict uh, uh, the, the uh, spectra or the stability and so on. So this is the general approach. So when you say network model, you mean you put one module something for the frame, one module for right. some interface. Yeah, maybe general. I have it here. Yeah, exactly. So you have different transfer matrices for the different elements. Most of them come from first principles, so just plain wave propagation by Helmholtz equation in the different elements. But the flame is the problem, and that needs to be to have some semi-empirical model or measured input. And this is put into the system matrix. And you have here your pressure and velocity fluctuations, eventually a source term, which is the general combustion noise. And that equation can be solved, either the homogeneous equation, which gives you then the eigenfrequencies where the oscillation occurs. Or if you have the non-homogeneous uh, term here, you can solve and you know the source term and include in this flame some non-linearity because you need some, some non-linear behavior in order to limit uh, the whole process, then you can even predict spectrum. 
So this is the uh, general situation noise. Uh, how do you model this noise? The combustion noise. Combustion noise is uh, generally coming from measurements. From measurements. It's, yeah, exactly. It's not yet. I mean, we are working, as I said, we have a project now on combustion noise to predict combustion noise, but just from a very simple jet flame. So we have a project where a lot of experiments are done in an unechoic room to measure for different operating parameters the combustion noise of this jet flame. And a compressible large eddy simulation project running in order to compare it with the experiments and to validate this model. And the hybrid model, where we have um, incompressible LES getting the source terms, and from this having an acoustic model to predict the noise propagation. What parameters? What is the attraction? For combustion noise? It's what, what parameters? Well, what parameters? Uh, the combustion noise is being influenced by a lot of different parameters. Turbulence, by equivalence ratio. Oh, so there's... I understand, but yeah. uh, from, from this experiment, what, what do you measure to put in your... Ah, well, what, what here measure? in this very simple approach, uh, we just uh, measure the sound spectra and put this in as an excitation. You also said you added some non-linearity in the flame. Mm -hmm. That was in order to, to get the limit cycle correct, right? So you get the right level. Right. But it's still just a, a single point, right, in space. So it has no extensions in the This is a wave space and not in real space. Or am I wrong? This is a wave equation you're solving. Mm -hmm. So it's basically you're solving in frequency space. No, you can also do it in time. Yeah, right, in time, yeah. and all as well, yeah. yeah. But you don't really... When you put your, your frame uh, module or something, mm -hmm. it's in a, a single point yeah, of course. space. Mm -hmm. So you said initially that the extent of the flame might have an influence. Might have an influence. It's uh, yeah. modeled yeah. As, a, as a, I mean, the flame oh. is considered to be very short with respect to the combustor dimensions. So it's single on a single right. point in space. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Where is the, in the modeling, where is the retraction of the heat release on the flame? It's uh, on the excitation? I mean, somewhere there, there must be a retraction. There must be a, the heat release done by the flame that uh, is coupled with the flame itself somewhere. You understand what I mean? No. <laughs> uh, the, the flame uh, make heat release? Yes. Noise? Yes. That comes back to the flame. Yeah, but that is included here. I mean, you where, where is it included? Together, all these elements. So you have yeah. here a heat release of the flame, which yes. causes fluctuations in P prime and U prime. Yes. Acoustic okay. perturbations. They travel in this direction. They come and back. in this direction. Then they come back and affect again the, the heat release here. Yeah, but in the modeling, uh, where where it is written. It's where where it is in the in the model somewhere? Uh, so you have mm -hmm. you need to have a system of equations. Yes. One uh, for the waves, with the coupling term with the uh, turbulent flow, and yes. you have also equations for the turbulent no, flow. In, no, in one, I mean the coupling from the fluctuations here. Here, this is included in the flame transfer function. Mm -hmm. This so is why I'm so going so slow. So so let's so let so me. The, the, yeah. the violet the violet stuff contains the p one u one p two u two. Is a function across the flame. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me show you. I think I have this here. Yeah. Maybe this answers. Maybe this answers a little bit of your question. So, what you have here is the burner and the flame. So the burner is pure fluid mechanics and can eventually still be modeled from first principle, but already quite complicated because you have a highly three-dimensional flow. So, flame getting more and more difficult. So what we do now is, what we want to know is actually how does this burner flame affect mm -hmm. the traveling waves, the acoustics downstream and upstream of the combustor. So you can put this in as in terms of a transfer matrix or scattering matrix. So if you do this, then 
The flame and the burner combines the upstream and the downstream waves in the following way. Okay. So you have here your downstream traveling wave, downstream of the combustor, you have your upstream traveling wave, upstream of your combustor, and you have your up your your okay. down, down downstream traveling wave upstream and so on. They are combined via this four element right. transfer mass. Plus you have a source term, and this maybe answers the question of the source term that you asked before. All of them we don't know from first principles. So if you want to solve this thing here, you have two equations, but you have six unknowns. So it's impossible to solve. What you need is to create three independent test states in order to predict this. Right? I mean, this is two, two equations. But six unknowns here: the four elements of the transfer matrix okay. plus the two um, elements of the of the combustion noise, okay. uncorrelated with this. So what we do is we create these different test states by applying forcing on our combustor. So we force either upstream or we force downstream, or we force the, the two large because at the same time we're not forcing at all in this way you create linear independent test states. You could do the same by changing the acoustic boundary conditions here. Mm. But this is more difficult, of course. So the forcing is very nice because you can your combustor <coughs> have running your combustor and change while it is running the acoustic boundary condition. If you would, via forcing, if you would need to change, for example, a nozzle here or something like this. This is much more difficult because you have hot parts and to it senses you need to stop it and so on. So this is the approach uh, we use to measure it. What is the form of source? The form of source. Source code. What do you write? Well, I mean, this is... Oh, it depends on concentration. No, it depends on... The we don't know. Oh, you don't know. No. This what is, uh, is I, as I said, we did not concentrate very much yet on the no. source term. Oh, the right. source term is now put in only as a measure. We did put a lot of thought into the modeling of these components, and I can show you the equations for this later. Mm -hmm. For this, is still under investigation and currently carried out in the project to have a better form for it's difficult because it depends on so many parameters. The combustion noise is, even for a simple jet flame, it's very difficult to predict the noise. What is the connection of the nature of operation with this uh, excitation This is because I don't understand. This equation is linear equation. Linear. In the reality, the problem is no mean, no mean. That's, uh, so, how, well, do we, how do we connect? Because <coughs> nature and separation are no mean. Well, first of all, the acoustics are, although you get maybe 100 to 1,000 millibar uh, in a gas turbine, you operate at 30 bars, so you can consider the acoustics to be yeah. linear, first. Second, this experiment is run at low amplitude. So you have no thermoacoustics in this experiment. You have unequal conditions here at the end of your combustor. So this is a non-excited experiment if you run it without acoustic excitation. If you run your acoustic excitation at the low, at finite low amplitudes, then you can also say the response of the whole system is linear. So you walk in the region where the amplitude. Well, we, we do both, but first of all, we work in the region where everything is linear. So we did, for example, try this out at different excitation amplitudes to validate whether we are in a linear regime or not. So the response and the coefficients look the same for, let's say, uh, excitation level A, B, and C. But the nonlinear response is of high interest for us. So we have actually a project where we do investigate the non-linear response of it by getting to extremely high levels of excitation. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same equation. Well, it's the same equation, but then one of the components here has a has a non has a non-linear behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 
depends on the maybe evolution of equations. So to prove if it's linear or nonlinear, you, you can do more tests. Yeah. And then fit in. Exactly. Mm. So um, this is just to show you an example, um, including a non-linear transfer function of such a complicated combustor. Uh, you see here, I don't remember how many burners it was, but quite a lot, and the huge thing. So you have not only plane wave propagation, but you have all kinds of different modes, acoustic modes in this combustor. And you can see here for um, the problem there was actually this engine was uh, getting too noisy, uh, had thermoacoustic instabilities. So the question was how to place uh, Helmholtz dampers, for example, in Helmholtz dampers, you are all familiar with what the Helmholtz dampers? Yeah? I don't know. <laughs> no? <laughs> the Helmholtz damper is a device where you have a neck and a volume, and you have a fluctuating air current here, and this creates a P no, uh, prime condition to zero at this condition, and is being used to um, damp noise actually. And uh, here you can see all these blue points are Helmholtz dampers operating at one frequency. You have these green things operating at another frequency. But then this frequency was too high. So what you could do is to move, for example, a Helmholtz damper, which is here, to modify this. You need to modify volume and neck length in order to operate it at a different frequency. But then you would, if you get this one down, then this would pop up again. So it's a, it's a coupled system, very difficult, and as you see, not a lot of space. Where should you put additional hammer samples? So we did this analysis in 3D and looked how to um, actually place them in different ways to control both frequencies in a better way. And the ex by the way, this is measured and experiment measured in an engine, in a gas turbine engine with these pretty simple models. So the red curve is the simulation and the blue curve is the measured one. And you get quite good agreement. Of course, it's tuned to this case and so on. So this is tuned, so we made the, the amplitude is tuned, but not the frequency, of course. But the amplitude is tuned by adjusting this non-linearity. <coughs> and then the prediction of this Improved design uh, is shown here. This is the red curve again. And then somebody went, I think it was in Alaska, went to Alaska and put in the hammer stampers, and that blue curve came out from the measurement. So quite a good, good How many parameters? Well, you have one parameter. Just one. Just one. Yeah. But here, here the parameter was not adapted anymore. Just here. Okay, I think, uh, so now we are coming to the. <coughs> you want to see some equations, yes. right? <laughs> Good. Um, maybe um, before I show this, just to show you a little bit the dependence and, and what is important. So for the burner. The most important element is this uh, T22 element of this transfer matrix. And this shows a little bit the behavior. And there you show one, you see one important parameter. And this is the phase lag. This lag, what I just explained, you have a combustor, you have a flame sitting here, and the time delay, tau for these disturbances getting convected into the flame. So if you increase, for example, the burner velocity, that time lag gets shorter, and this, uh, this curve then, uh, for example, uh, gives you a new transfer function for, for this uh, uh, higher burner velocity. Um, So, in principle, the reacting Navier-Stokes equations describe everything. Yeah. <laughs> also, also here. So, if your conservation of mass, momentum, and energy 
uh, for moving volume, and we have the uh, Reynolds transport theorem, which describes you how this is actually being propagated and transported uh, in your. <coughs> what is it for? Sorry. What is it for? Could you please uh, define? Ah, this, this is the concentration. Uh, this this is the concentration. Okay. So you have conservation of, of mass, which you see here. You have conservation of momentum. You have conservation of energy. There is a temperature gradient. You have mean temperature gradient. Mm -hmm. You have the viscous stresses, so this tau here uh, is of course not the tau I was describing before, but it's the viscous forces uh, you, you have. You have a heat flux, you have the equation of state, combining your P, uh, relating your uh, P to rho and T, assuming also an ideal gas, which might also not be true for all the cases, but uh, that's uh, the assumption. You have the entropy, and you have the specific heat ratio. This is all equations which are important in the first place. So this equation for the total. But yeah. you have also fluctuations. So you have the average these equations. Yeah, of course. And this is the next point. Then. Yeah. You expand this uh, by expanding your all your terms which can fluctuate into a mean term into the fluctuating. Okay. Um, entropy, we didn't talk yet about this. Entropy might also play a significant role here. Generally, uh, we were only discussing in the place now that we have fluctuations here in terms of the heat release. But what can also happen is if you have fluctuations here in the heat release, you have hot spots and cold spots being convected downstream in your combustor, getting into a nozzle, and if you have an entropy <coughs> fluctuation, getting into an area change, this creates again a pressure fluctuation and thus affects also the combustion. So this might be also considered. Generally for gas turbine combustors with a high, very extremely high turbulence level, so we're talking about turbulence levels about 30% and more, um, these entropy fluctuations are assumed to get dissipated uh, by the time uh, they travel downstream the combustor. What is the form of Q in the equation of the entropy? Last term, Q, Q large. Heat, heat release. Heat release. Heat release. Yeah. How it depends on uh, all the parameters? Well, heat Temp release, for example. Um, this is power law? No, like we have seen yesterday. Where is he? He just left. Ah, he just left. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, the reaction rates and uh, related to anthropic information. Something. Yeah. Entropy of the species wow. and the reaction rate. Uh -huh. Basically, yeah. the sum of these, the time of these two are sums together. Uh -huh. yeah. it, 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 it should be so, so small in, in chemical, uh, uh, chemical uh, equations with some the energy release. Yeah. Something in this field should be, right? Some energy release. Very small. Very small. Very small. Arrhenius law. Okay. law. Well, law. Arrhenius equation. For example, you can model that by Arrhenius equation. Yes. But you need to find uh, some condition across the flame, and this is again the problem as we have seen, a similar problem as you have shown, shown yesterday. Yeah. Okay, so this is this. Excuse me. Yeah. A, a little detail. You don't take into account the bulk viscosity for the viscous stress. Uh, I don't take into account the, the bulk viscosity. The bulk viscosity. The bulk viscosity. Yeah. You assume no. zero bulk viscosity. Second. And uh, usually, when when you do acoustics uh, yeah. damping, acoustic damping, maybe it's, it may be important to take into account the bulk. It's correct, um, but we neglect it because in our case it does not play significant role. Viscous okay. uh, damping in terms of the acoustic acoustics uh, is second order. Is second order in okay. this case. Yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, I'm talking now longer than expected. So <laughs> <laughs> it's always 
It's always it's like that. Like <laughs> that. <laughs> but he was, I mean, this I just read out, so, um, but let's see, what, what else do we have here? Then we have this question, how to get the um, fluctuations into this was what I just said. This answers, I think, your question, so you expand it uh, in terms of a generic flow value, but you apply this to velocity, pr uh, pressure, as well as to uh, density. Okay, so this is also clear, I think. Generally, um, these perturbations are still thought to be of small value with respect to the mean flow. Also, that, so of course, is not this, always true. This approximation implies that you consider the case of low in old number, low in clear number, and you consider small, a small fluctuation. When we consider small fluctuations, what was Yeah, this implies that you consider the case of low in Reynolds number, and now in Reynolds now, and low in Pickle number. What has the Reynolds number to do with the fluctuations? That I don't see. Inversely, it's a greater or huge than the Yeah. No. If it's it's a number, I mean, there's, there's a number of Reynolds numbers. Which Reynolds number are we talking about? The just fluid flow. Yeah, not the turbulent Reynolds number. You know, but it's not it's not said that the Reynolds number must be. It, on the contrary, it's it's very it's high. high. It's it's high. Just it's huge. Yeah. It's it's by it's it's exactly. More. So therefore, also all uh, all the uh, viscous. Uh, Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It should be always low in low yeah. yeah. If okay. fluctuation is small, it means uh, no fluctuation at all, just one minute. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Real scientists. Yeah, real yeah. scientists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you Correct. Of course, I should not have written this, but uh, the if yeah. you do it's not small, assume this, it is getting so into the non-linearities, <laughs> okay. and that we do not want to consider in the first place. Okay. Yeah. So you like the non-linearities? So say that they play me. I don't understand you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's continue because we have not so many time. But you wanted to see the equation. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to stop since a long time. <laughs> so this uh, we oops. This we discussed already. Um, then you go into the classical act. This was the flow and the heat release. Now we look into terms of acoustics. Um, generally what we assume is in this, if you, if you talk the first of, of the non-reacting case and the non-moving case, velocity as well as heat release are zero. Then um, your average phi is constant for all these variables also constant. Then you can write the perturbation of the flow variables there. And uh, you see then here the variables normalized with the mean quantities. These are the important first order terms and if you um, put now in and look, put now a disturbance term in, uh, a harmonic disturbance time described here by this exponential function where k is the wave number, then uh, this leads you to the uh, well-known Helmholtz wave equation which you see here. And this is the wave equation for the non-proper gating case. So this is the other uh, equation which we need to, which plays an important role here in ah, general. Mm -hmm. Linear, uh, again, small perturbations of, small pressure. perturbations of pressure. And compressible, uh, so it means that compressible contribution uh, to velocity is small compared with the, uh, how to say, edges. Now, 
this is now this is now uh, uh, what I put in here. It's actually I know that you probably will get into the equation, so I took it from a class we are giving in terms of acoustics. So uh, this is uh, the the acoustic case, but for the propagation, uh, including the propagation. As I said, generally we do not include. It's not necessary to include the propagation because the Mach number in your combustor is very low. But if you have cases where your mean flow uh, gets comparable to the speed of sound, then you need, of course, to consider uh, the propagation, and then you need uh, here the um, uh, Helmholtz equation, which includes... Uh, I have a question. Uh, the mean, could it be allowing to have some unsteady, yeah, unsteady means? You bar? Uh, do you really need the mean? Well, in this case, of course, yeah, but uh, I mean, the whole thing is to be thought um, a quasi-steady case. Okay. Transients, as well, then it becomes very complicated. The case. Yeah. Why, why would this be important? No, I was thinking that this, this uh, assumption of a small perturbation, yeah? if we consider this perturbation, this perturbation based on turbulence, yes. the extra, extra thing that we have for the, for the noise, not for the, for the low frequency or for the, for the turbulence. When we are wrong, do you understand what I mean? Not exactly. You have the unsteady part, and on um, yeah. top of that, you have the perturbation. Yes. You perturb not on the mean, but on um, the Okay. Yeah, yeah, but the, tra the transit that we do not consider in our case here. So it's assumed to be quasi quasi state, okay, in the first place. I'm I'm um, I'm not this this I mean we, we did look in transit, for example, but that's very difficult because your response also has then some time delay, or as it's uh, it's not considered in this analysis. Which is more complex? Yeah. Could you please show previous slide? Yes. You. So you have a constant mean flow, mm -hmm. and you y q bar equals zero. Well, this is still the non-reacting mean flow. Ah, it's not a reaction. So flow variables, as we discussed, can be separated. So all of these play a role. We have the acoustic mode, which plays a role. The acoustics. Mm -hmm. We have vorticities, vortices, which play a role and might also actually propagate within your flow and uh, lead to a fluctuating pressure field. And we have the entropy, as I discussed before. And this is all the equations you get then for the um, different modes, for the acoustic mode, discussed as being uh, seen in the Helmholtz equation, either in the convective Helmholtz equation or in the non-convective. Uh, term and we have the vorticity and the entropy fluctuations generally um, well in our case are uh, mm -hmm. assumed to, to play not to mm -hmm. so these are not coupled equations right They're not coupled uh, okay. in this uncoupled. case they are first uncoupled yeah yeah right. but of course if you for example want to consider, as I said, the entropy fluctuations, then you need to find a coupling condition to the pressure fluctuations, which you generally do by the exit condition. So in this case, your network model consists not only of the uh, propagating sound waves, but you include also the convected entropy fluctuation, which is being transformed at the boundary condition into a pressure fluctuation, and this is how you uh, do the coupling with the entropy. So when you but here, in this case, it's So when you add heating, then these will be coupled? No, 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 not necessarily, but no, not by the heating. No. Again, still here, uh, Q 
uh, bar zero. But if you if you have heat release fluctuations, they create pressure fluctuations, which is described by U prime and P prime. And then you have uh, entropy fluctuations, S prime, being compacted by the mean flow downstream. The coupling to the pressure is done via the exit boundary. Yeah. And then again, they can affect the heat release, and then, yeah. you, have the, yeah. then you have the complete yeah. coupling. Um, this is also, and this explains, I think this is not necessary here because you all know this. This describes a little bit of the different modes, the acoustic mode, how this acts, and describes also the vortical mode, which we generally do not uh, consider to have a significant influence as well. Maybe you consider interaction now between flow and waves? Yeah. Okay. That I can show. So you, you want to, let me see whether we are in the this actually. Um, so you're interested now how the um, combination actually from the velocity fluctuation to the, to the heat release. Yeah. Just a second. I didn't know that we go this much into detail already, so let me quickly know. So generally, this is being separated. First of all, we need an acoustic model for the burner, and this acoustic model for the burner includes a reduced length and a pressure restraint. This is the important parameters for the acoustics for the burner element. And for the flame element, we need somewhat the discipline what does the velocity fluctuation do to the heat release. And uh, this is done by a rankine gouverneur uh, condition, as you showed yesterday, with partial premixing. And com coming to it includes then two parameters. One is some kind of interaction index, how the velocity fluctuation interacts with your heat release, and a certain time delay. In addition to this, we do not consider only a single time delay, as you would do, for example, for a weaker tube. You are all familiar with a weaker tube. This is a, um, a tube uh, which has, at its lower part, a heated gauze. And when you heat this, uh, you get a t you have, uh, you have turbulent noise in there, you have convection in there. And uh, this forms an acoustic standing wave in, in, your, in, this, in this tube. And the heat release of this gauze is being affected by the velocity fluctuations and by a certain time delay. But the time delay there is uniform. This is not the case here in the frame. So the next step is then um, to find, for example, a, a 1D model. And here, by this 
1D model, we say, okay, the fluctuations in equivalence ratio are being convected downstream to the flame and arrive at uh, the flame at the time t minus tau. Mm -hmm. And this can be combined into a 1D model, so combining your velocity fluctuations upstream of the flame to the velocity fluctuations downstream of the flame by a very simple approach in the first place by uh, this uh, model where omega is the fluctuation frequency and tau this time delay I was talking about. So uh, the loss of all the variables depends on uh, direction of propagation or in the equilibrium? No. In 1D model? In 1D model, it's only in the direction of propagation. Okay. And mm -hmm. also, maybe this is also one of the limitations of this model. Mm -hmm. Generally, the transportation through this burner does not include any higher acoustic mode. So within this element, it's limited uh, in streamwise direction. Mm -hmm. But you can improve this model by considering a 3D flame shape at least. And this is being done then here. This is somewhat uh, it, um, including the distribution along the shape of the flame. Because the problem is the time delay, for example, at this position is not necessarily the same as in the center. So you have a number of different time delays across the radius of such a flame. As you see here by the stream lines. If you assume same bulk velocity, then uh, due to the different length, due to the flame shape, you have different uh, convection times into the flame. Alright? Mm -hmm. But tau is a few parameter. It's a delay, delay time. It, yeah. But n, why n is fixed? It's, it's a well, the n is given, is the interaction ratio, and this is given by the temperature ratio there. So it's, a, it's not tuning parameter. No, it's not a tuning parameter. So just one tuning parameter. Well, if you include that, the three-dimensional case, then you have two. You have the time delay, but the time delay is different. So what we generally include is here this distribution function. Or you could say it's a mean time delay plus a delta tau for the different locations. Yeah. Then you have two tuning parameters in terms of your And well, this is different. Uh, yeah, this is, well, maybe this is, is quite nice because this shows you uh, how this model then fits. Actually, this is, the red curve is the measured T22. This is this element which uh, combines this U prime upstream of the frame down, uh, to the U prime downstream of the flame. By the way, I did not mention the P prime is assumed to be constant over the flame. So P is not affected. It's just the U prime which is mostly affected by the heat release. Okay. Which is also, can be, I mean this is uh, an analytical assumption but it can be proven and validated by an experiment that your P prime distribution across the flame is negligible. So this is the measured uh, transfer function. If you just assume a normal N tau model, then you get this distribution. This would be the case of the weak BQ, for example. And you see uh, it does not fit very well. But if you take this uh, distribution function into account, then you get a very well agreement with the measured function and the model function. So you, you suppose that the flame is distributed in the, in the length? Well, in the length also. In the length also, yeah. So Along with the flame, the flame is well, actually, what I have to say is that the flame generally is really uh, located at, an, at a pretty uh, short axial <coughs> distance and distance and very much equally distributed. What is different is if you have such a burner, then the streamlines or the convection times from the different fuel injection ports are. The, making the distribution more than the flame. 
but it doesn't matter. It could be the flame or the fuel is it's the same result. So it's a similar to the situation. Correct. Yeah. It's in similar to it in some sense it's similar to the dissipation. So the stronger this dissipation is, this the most stable the system is actually the more the higher the spread of the time delays, thus uh, related to the dissipation, the more stable the system is. Correct. But why you write M tau? M, M is fixed. Why you write all time? M? Well, I mean, it's fixed, but of course it depends on the operational parameters. We operate this burner up only in one parameter. We operate it at different parameters. So you in, introduce, for example, a, 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 a different power, <laughs> thus a different temperature, then your end changes. Because for, I know a little bit about the rocket. Yeah. <laughs> Their end is not constant. Their end is not. So here it's. But in principle, it's the same end. I mean, it's also the temperature ratio, but it's very difficult to predict it for uh, rocket. In your case, it's. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Because we have 10 minutes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think, I mean, this is basically, uh, basic, I could go much deeper into detail, there's a number of other things, but I think this explains already uh, the fundamentals of most of the stuff. Now you could go at every step more into detail. For example, what is needed is better uh, analytic description, for example, of this transfer function. There's a number of unknowns. What, for example, does pressure to this result. It's very easy to find good models in terms of the uh, thermoacoustic uh, transfer function for gaseous combustion, but it is very difficult to do the same for liquid fuel combustion, because for liquid fuel combustion you have, first of all, the spray depends highly on pressure. You have uh, to take into account the uh, evaporation time, you have to take into account the different distribution due to convection and so on, so it's much more difficult. And you have to, these, uh, these ignition delay times to include in, in, in terms of liquid fuels. So liquid fuels is still a big problem for us. The results I have shown you are mostly for, um, for gaseous uh, combustion. Then uh, a problem is how to determine this uh, this transfer function, I mean, either from analytical model or from CFD. So, maybe there I can say a few words. CFD, you see here, the main parameters of this, uh, of this model, maybe even going one back, is L and zeta, which is describing the burner without, uh, flame, and this can be done. This can be uh, this you can get, for example. I mean, the zeta you get from steady state uh, CFD, for example. You can use runs models and so on, then you get the zeta. So you have one parameter. I mean, let's say, talk you have a model and you do not want to do, you do not want to measure. The L is an acoustic L which you can either calculate from unsteady Bernoulli equation or you could use acoustic models which give you also this uh, reduced length like a finite element analysis. So you have these two parameters from steady state models. How to get n and tau. Well, n, we said, is mainly the temperature distribution, so you need to know what the temperature distribution is, either from CFD, including some reduced um, combustion models, or, yeah, I don't know, from experience, but mostly you can get from here. Then the tau is the problem. And for the tau, what we generally do uh, in terms of having simple models is to run also steady state CFD with a reduced combustion model, then you get uh, a flame shape from um, looking, for example, at reaction variables. You can see where the flame front is sitting, and then you can calculate from the different fuel injectors the transportation time, the convection time within your flame. So this includes this model. It does 